Hi, Danette. I'm your assistant, here to help you throughout your day. Here are some things you can... Okay, good afternoon. Uh, this is Micah with Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies Coalition of Georgia. Thank you very much for joining our webinar today. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies, uh, our mission is to improve maternal and infant health through education, access to vital resources, and advocacy. Um, and if you are interested in learning more about the work that we do, uh, our call center, or, or any of our advocacy or education initiatives, please visit our website um, at the link that you see there provided on the screen. Um, you can also sign up for newsletter updates uh, as well as um, upcoming events that we have, webinars, et cetera. So we will have another webinar next month as well. So if you're interested in that. But um, again, thank you for joining. Our, uh, our webinar today is around community-based participatory research, specifically around perinatal mood and anxiety disorder amongst African-American women. So we're very excited um, to hear from our presenters. Um, as a note, um, this webinar um, is really in celebration of um, Maternal Mental Health Month and, um, and Maternal Mental Health Day was May 1st. And so uh, we were very excited to be presented with the proclamation. And, and so we're very thankful for all our partners that work with us throughout the state on that, um, on a proclamation for Maternal Mental Health Day. And so this webinar is just an extension of our continued advocacy and work around this issue. So we thank you for prioritizing it and uh, joining us as well. Uh, as another note, the, it is approved for one credit hour for nurses. Um, and so if you're interested in receiving that credit hour, um, you will receive a survey at the end of this webinar, probably within a day or so. You will complete that survey and we will send you a certificate within the week. Um, so that's it. So I will let our presenters um, introduce themselves. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Natalie Hernandez, our first presenter. And um, again, we thank you for joining us. Okay, Dr. Hernandez, you should be able to advance your slides. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, trying to advance it. Let's see. Nope. Let me try. Um, let me try one more time. Okay, give it a try now. There we go, whoops. Mm -hmm. All right, well, um, thank you so much for being here. As uh, Micah mentioned, um, today we're gonna talk about community-engaged research and the work that we've been doing around mental health disparities. Um, particularly around um, black women. And before we get started, we would just wanted to talk a little bit about who the presenters are. And so I'll have my colleague and partner in good, um, Danette, talk about who she is really quickly. And then I'll introduce a little bit more about myself. Good afternoon, everyone. We are so glad that you're joining us. And thank you so much, Natalie and Micah. Um, I am a senior strategist for First Team America, and we primarily are a technical assistance agency. Um, but prior to that, I've had 35 years of experience in prevention and intervention with juvenile justice, Department of Family and Children's Services, uh, law enforcement, and public schools. I came over to public health back in um, the early part of 2000 with Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Project. And I found a great home with maternal and child health and love the work that we're doing um, for maternal mental health. Um, I'm the facilitator and coordinator of the Atlanta Healthy Start Initiatives Community Action Network. 
which is um, funded through HRSA, and it is housed at the Center for Black Women's Wellness. And I'm also the regional board president for the Center for Family and Community Wellness, which is primarily concerned with the trauma uh, that communities of color experience um, with justice, labor, housing, public health, and education. My interests are maternal mental wellness, adverse childhood experiences, child welfare and abuse, community-based participatory research, um, social justice, social determinants of health, and understanding how trauma awareness leads to trauma responsive cities. And we'll talk about um, some of this as we go through the presentation. Great, thank you, Dana. And um, as I mentioned before, I'm Natalie Hernandez. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Community Health and Preventive Medicine at Morehouse School of Medicine. I have over 15 years of developing um, community-based um, interventions. I worked for one of the largest civil rights and advocacy organizations in the country, um, developing national programs around maternal and child health and working primarily developing programs and working with promotoras de salud or community health workers. Um, I'm also a trained HRSA researcher um, through the Maternal and Child Health Bureau um, in maternal and child health epidemiology and maternal and child health um, leadership trainee. Um, and currently, um, the PI of this project, along with the Center for Black Women's Wellness. And again, um, I'm really interested in how research translates into action with communities. So not doing research for research sake, but making sure that it gets to communities. And so a big part of that is working together. And I always like to start off with a quote, you know, unity is strength when there is teamwork and collaboration, wonderful things can be achieved. And I think we're seeing that currently um, with this project, even though it's in its infancy stages, but we're seeing a lot of wonderful work that's happening. And I, that's, I think that's at the crust of what um, community-based participatory research is. Now, community-based participatory research differs a little than traditional research. Um, and historically, research has not has been conducted that doesn't benefit the community and actually has harmed communities. And the result of that, that's created a lot of distrust within the communities, um, particularly communities that are most impacted by health inequities. They're least likely to be involved in the research process, which often leads to ineffective interventions um, So and the distrust because a lot of these research um, creates programs that are not tailored to the concerns and culture of the participants and rarely includes the participants. And lastly, these interventions are focused on individuals rather than the broader social and structural determinants. So what is community-based participatory research? It's an approach to research. So it's not a methodology, but an approach. Um, it's found that community input is invaluable in the design and adaptation of research instruments to make things that are user-friendly. Um, one of the key things about um, community participatory research is that it equi equitably involves all partners in all aspects of the research. So as you see with this uh, maternal mental health project, I am the PI, but Center for Black Women's Wellness is also the PI. We are in an equitable relationship. I am not above who um, Center for Black Women's Wellness is. Um, and again, it integrates the knowledge gained with the community. The key words in community-based participatory research are collaborative, equitable partners, and achieving social change. Um, big benefits of CBPR is that it provides resources for communities involved. Trust and respect are two common reasons why people don't participate in research. And so again, it allows people to develop that trust and rapport. And the specific outcome of CBPR research is not simply to find answers to complex social questions, but to have those results provide information that can be used by the community to develop its own solutions. So a little bit about um, CBPR and mental health. Um, so CBPR has been used in a lot of different research topics, but typically has been not included when it comes to mental health. Um, mental health services research typically has left out community voices, resulting in delays of translation of research into practice with communities. And due to this need, in 2003, the President's New Freedom Commission on Mental Health Report recommended that mental health care be consumer and family driven 
through the direct involvement of communities. And that's why when we were thinking about a project, using CBPR in mental health was really important. Um, again, we, as you saw with the benefits of it. So what is this project that I keep alluding to? Um, this is a pilot project that was funded through the Detroit Community Academic Urban Research Center. Um, which is housed in the University of Michigan School of Public Health. It's actually a larger grant that University of Michigan got through NIH and it's a federal, federal flow through. Um, it uses a mixed methods approach, which means that we do um, some quantitative research, which will include surveys and qualitative research, which includes um, interviews. And um, a big part of CBPR is that the topic is identified by the community. And so as you, you'll hear from Danette, you know, how this topic became to be identified. What I can tell you is that at Morehouse School of Medicine, we do a community health needs and assets assessment every three years. And every single year that we've done it or every, you know, block of time that we've done it, mental health has also come up as a major issue the community wants prioritized and addressed. So a little bit about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and what the project is trying to do. Um, PMADs are common in the perinatal period um, and when left untreated poses significant risk to women. Um, as you see here on the slide, up to one in five women develop mental health problems, particularly for African-American women, they're estimating that number to be one in four. Um, it, in Georgia, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders affect approximately 30,000 women um, each year. And there are a lot of adverse consequences associated with it, including poor self-care and nutrition, um, impaired fetal and maternal attachment, lack of medical care, increased likelihood of substance use disorders and ab abuse, and a heightened risk of suicide. Um, and perinatal mood and anxiety disorders is the leading contributor to um, perinatal um, uh, morbidity. And it has also been included as a primary risk for um, maternal mortality due to suicide. And there are particularly disparities um, when it comes to maternal mental health. Um, we see that black women and women of color generally have a higher risk of de developing a PMAD. And black women are usually screened at lower rates. Um, there's been theories about why this may be occurring. Um, one of the things is that current screening tools don't really capture black women's experiences. Um, a lot of them are asking about you know, how they're feeling when black women tend to talk about mental health through physical symptoms. Um, also with black women, a lot of these things are situational. And so maybe at the time it's not capturing. And we also know, particularly with black communities, there's so much stigma associated with um, mental health. Um, and that's, again, these are the things that the project is trying to accomplish. Even when black women are diagnosed or have received screening, 60% of them do not receive the proper treatment or support that they need for perinatal emotional concerns. And this is a huge concern because in Georgia, 76 of the state's 159 counties don't have a licensed psychologist. And also a lot of counties don't have um, social workers to be able to help these women with these um, experiences that they are going through. So based upon this collective impact framework um, and a social determinants of health framework, the purpose of the study is to assess the mental and emotional health challenges of underserved women. Currently, there's not baseline data that exists, particularly for African-American women around maternal mental health. And so that's something we want to capture with the survey. And then to examine local priorities and sources of care. So what is it that these women need? How, how can we adapt current screening tools to really capture Black women's narratives and really center their voices and empower Black women's voices to be heard rather than as researchers or other communities um, putting our voices on what we think they need. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the community and then I'll hand it over to Danette. So the research partner communities or the, the communities that we currently engage in in Atlanta um, are a majority African-American, so 88% African-American, have an average household income of only $23,000, a 21% in unemployment rate, and almost 40% of the women in the community are living in poverty. 
They're also ranked the lowest with respect to um, neighborhood health and quality amongst other parts of Atlanta. And these are pictures of the local community where the Center for Black Women's Wellness is located. And Danette, I'll hand it over to you. Danette, you might have to unmute yourself. Thank you so much, because I was definitely on mute. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, identifying community, strong community partners is a key factor for uh, CBPR. Um, the Atlanta Healthy Start Initiative Community Action Network, um, which is um, a robust and, and very engaged and interactive par um, partnership, of over 50 community agencies, as 200 members representing families, and so, so forth, and you'll see that soon, um, was a, was a great place for CBPR to be implemented um, in Atlanta and with this particular project. Um, you have to also look at building or strengthening community coalition for engagement. So identifying any uh, areas that need improvement in the coalition. And because um, Atlanta Healthy Start Initiative, in partnership with the Georgia Department of Public Health, um, had a technical assistance grant with uh, CityMatch, uh, we have been analyzing best practices and our process for evaluating um, our coalition and our collective impact framework. A, a common agenda, um, a, a one agenda is very important with CBPR. And, um, the agenda for this particular project was maternal mental wellness, uh, but it did have some uh, reinforcing agendas as early brain development and breastfeeding. Strong backbone support is important to, act to actually execute this particular type of project. There's a lot of administrative uh, things that are needed to have in place uh, from orientations to um, trainings and so forth, and we'll share that with you, but it's, all, it's, it's vital to have strong backbone support, an agency that is committed to making sure that this goes without a hitch. And for, for this particular project, the Center for Black Women's Wellness was and has been the backbone support. Conduct a formal or informal community needs assessment. Natalie talked about the importance of doing that, and she talked about Morehouse doing it every three years. We conducted formal and informal needs assessments within the Community Action Network as well as in the community. And we had three sessions um, for 90 days that presented some different scenarios to reinforce the need for maternal mental wellness. But it also shared with us the strategy necessary to, um, to approach this. Um, and in leading into that, we made sure that the community was involved in every aspect of the planning, the training, and research. And you'll see that in the next slide. Also, another key factor is to make sure that you celebrate the milestones along the way. Regardless of how small they are, they, could be, they may be, appear to be minute, but when you are working with community members and community partners, it's very important to let them know along the way the great job that they're doing and how, you know, just make, making sure that everyone is aware that we are inching along and eventually, you know, we will be at our destination. And so I think that's one of the, that's one of the, uh, you know, a lot of people don't think about celebrating. They don't think about acknowledging the work that's being done. And I think it keeps the momentum built um, when you're doing that along the way. Also, it's important to continue to listen to community shifts. It's community shifts in one direction regarding uh, mental health or mental wellness or if there's some other factors, that 
understanding and listening allows you to adjust the approach, not the instrument, not the document, but how you approach the community to uh, conduct the research. Natalie, can you advance it, please? Yeah, I'm trying to, but it's not moving. Okay, there we go. Oops, it's a little slow. There we go, great. Thank you. So for, for um, the sake of, of this webinar, we'd like to use the Center for Black Women's Wellness Atlanta Healthy Start Initiative Community Action Network as the case study. And I've shared a little bit with you in the previous slide, um, but the um, Atlanta Healthy Start Initiative Community Action Network has over 200 community members representing families, agencies, and public and private entities. And it um, has actually been in existence for over 20 years. Initially, it was called the Atlanta Healthy Start Consortium. And then uh, six years ago, HRSA made a change that each Healthy Start site uh, that's funded through, of course, Maternal and Child Health Bureau, that they would implement community action networks and a collective impact framework. Fortunately, the Atlanta Healthy Start Initiative can, Consortium, which is now, of course, known as the Community Action Network, was already one step ahead. We were already looking at collective impact strategies for effective community collaboration. So it was a win-win for us, and it's been a win-win for all of our partnering agencies. One of the components of collective impact is to establish a common agenda. And we had a little challenge with this at first because uh, people were very passionate about several areas, one being breastfeeding, the other uh, early learning literacy, which is now known universally as early brain development, and then, of course, maternal mental wellness. Safe sleep, smoking cessation, and a host of other factors also presented themselves. So the group came together and voted on the most important impact focus areas that they thought that they could get some traction on to really make a difference, not only in the lives of the families that were being served, but also through the community, and also that could also uh, be something to promote for policy change. As a result of that, three impact focus areas were identified, breastfeeding, early brain development, and maternal mental wellness. Last year, 12, 2017, uh, maternal mental wellness rose to the top as the primary impact focus area and the agenda for the CAN. And with that became the establishment of the CPPR project um, so that we could look at ways that we could influence policy and influence sustainability. We established work groups, and those are the work groups that I shared with you just now. And of course, we discussed the strong backbone support. Those are all key factors in this particular case study. Um, this is just an illustration of a few of our CAN partners. Um, we have uh, here maternal mental health organizations and family health organizations and some individuals. Um, and shared ownership and shared leadership are the pillars of the Community Action Network. Uh, the CAN meets on a monthly basis and is very strategic and intentional about maternal mental health and making sure that everything is. Um, moving forward. Now the work groups um, typically meet either during the CAN meetings, which we are able to get a lot of great feedback from the community partners, and then they also meet uh, um, outside of the meetings through conference calls or Zoom meetings or uh, go-to meetings or webinars. And the purpose of the work groups is for each uh, CAN partner to be vested in the um, approach and the direction and the implementation of our common agenda. So this is where strategies are created for policy, governance, infrastructure, evaluation, and sustainability. So 
So this is where um, actually during one of the work groups, um, there were ethical concerns expressed by um, our stakeholders, which were members of the CAN. Um, a lot of them thought, yes, this is an issue we need to address, but how are we going to be conducting this research in an ethical way? And thus, these are some of the concerns that came about. So in essence, we had to come together and have did sort of like a com community review of the research plan. And again, it was to increase the community stakeholders awareness of the various aspects of research, um, the benefits of what this research will entail and, and, and get a sense from them, what are their concerns? And one of the concerns was related to community consent. Like, can we conduct this research um, but we need to get consent from the community. And the community in this case being the CAN, but also community members. So CAN members going to the community to say, is this a research project that should be, that should happen? And what were the concerns related to that? Um, and what we found is, and what we typically find in research, that this is often a step that's not taken. And although it takes a lot of extra time, we wanted to ensure that we were doing things the right way and with the community um, being in the in the in the you know being the forefront of everything that we do. Um, because what happens is, particularly when it comes to sensitive issues as such, is that they don't want, if, if research came out about mental health of African-American communities, what type of stigma or what type of negative press would happen with that? Are we gonna say now, oh, all black women are crazy or these are the sort of, so they were really concerned with how the research would be portrayed and, and held, you know, and made sure that we were accountable and transparent about how we were sharing those research findings. And so what we came to a consensus was that whatever research we found, we would share it with the CAN first before we presented it out to any type of um, community setting or any type of you know, academic sharing setting. Another concern was related to both the mother and child, and that's here you see fetal safety and maternal risk. If women are taking the survey, would it cause them to have some adverse reaction to it and thus hurt not only themselves, but then also the child within? And so as a researcher and through IRB protocols, which is our institutional review boards, it came to be that this research study was found to be of minimum risk, meaning that if participants, when they participate, there would be no more higher risk than what they currently experience every single day. What was interesting that came out of that conversation, too, was that, well, you know, some community members said, well, how do you know what type of risk we experience every day? Because as black women, what you what for another woman may be minimum risk is high risk for us because we come from situations where we're low income or we have, you know, not so higher levels of education, particularly in the communities that we're working in. Another thing related to that also was informed consent. Um, so what in research, informed consent is almost like a permission slip to be able to conduct the research. Um, uh, what a lot of um, participants said, or you know, a lot of community members said is that these forms are just filled with language that is not understandable to the community. So how are we gonna rework it? And you'll see later in the presentation how we went through the informed consent, how we thought about the use of infographics and even doing a lot of training on how to explain the survey or even the, the research study to someone that may have a sixth grade reading level. And then again, always be a, a, accountable to sharing information and re-engaging the community in every single step of the research process. And so those were things that, those were ethical concerns expressed by our CAN members and even um, other community stakeholders. Um, and so a little bit about the process and how we did all of this, and this usually doesn't happen with a lot of studies, but we wanted to make sure that it did for this, because we wanted to stay true to what CBPR principles were. And so again, we collaboratively um, developed not only the study procedures, but everything related to the ethical review board. Um, so as the academic partner, we drafted a protocol and questions based on the literature, and our CAN partners came in and developed protocols based on 
what their experiences are with the communities, those concerns that you saw on the slide before that were expressed, and their local priorities. And then we came together during work groups, through emails, through phone calls to refine the instruments and with the drafts always reviewed by the CAN. So no, nothing ever went out without the CAN reviewing it. And this was an iterative process. Like this didn't just happen overnight. This took months, even with the survey, it took a couple of months just to come up with a short survey because we wanted, again, to ensure that we were abiding by the principles of CBPR, but also being respectful of the CAN members who are key partners in the research study. Um, and then I'll put it back to um, Danette to talk a little bit about the research orientation. Thank you. So <clears throat> one of the things that we wanted to make sure, especially from a research standpoint, was that everything was done ethically and that everyone understood and that we were sensitive to the needs of the community as Natalie just shared. So we looked at multiple intelligence frameworks looking at uh, trying to understand how interactive we needed to be during the orient I mean during the orientation so that a non clinician, non college educated person would be able to conduct the survey just like someone with a PhD. So we did role playing, we had teach backs, we looked at incorporating music um, and just all kinds of different strategies so that it would appear to be very academic and very technical, that it would take some of the uh, stigma off of it, of the research, but also that it would make it easy for them and that they would be comfortable in sharing this information with either their family members or uh, community members or even possible clients. So before anyone is able to ac actually conduct the survey, any site has to go through an orientation. So that means that every site, there's, every site is supposed to have a site coordinator, and that site coordinator will, will recruit other persons from their team to serve as uh, research uh, interviewers, I mean, or, excuse me, research interviewers, survey uh, conductors, or proctors. We realize in our environment there are a lot of factors that can come to play while you're conducting the research. And one being that um, if moms have babies with them, um, they, somebody may need to be available to assist with the baby. Or if mom has a cell phone going off every five minutes, we need to be sensitive and know how to communicate with mom to let her know that you know we just need to finish this and things of that nature and several scenarios so this is this research orientation uh has been very valuable to our uh, process the survey administration activities we you know wanted to find opportunities that were already in existence where we could go and um and, and maybe just you know set up a table and share the survey with those that are eligible in the community. So our CAN partners, um, and we have several, and I will share with you those that have been actively engaged with this um, in another slide. Uh, but the CAN partners have come together and, come and created some very interesting ways to do the research. We've had community baby showers. We've had a mommy and daddy wellness event. Um, and we've also had just uh, some uh, group sessions that moms have uh, come to um, and have received, um, conducted the survey. So we've always looked at some different ways to do that. This is one of the baby showers with one of our CAN partners um, that we've conducted surveys research. Natalie mentioned earlier about making sure that the CAN was engaged with every aspect. And before we actually launched the formal um, research, we did a pilot with 50 women, um, pregnant women, or those that had recently delivered, and we asked them questions about the survey instrument. We asked them questions about um, the consent form, and they helped us frame the current documents that you see. 
We then returned those back to the can and for three different revisions, I think we had three or four revisions, to, to make sure that we were um, presenting this in a manner that women could receive it. So on the left side um, is just a little bit about maternal mental health, facts and figures that you should know. And as and Natalie in, um, indicated earlier, that we've added some infographics there so that they can see the picture and then the, the information underneath in case they are read, reading at a, a grade school level. In the, se in the second, um, the center uh, slide, uh, you see it says professional standards for administering the survey. We took great lengths to make sure that from the first time the uh, survey uh, participant is presented to the, the research uh, interviewer from the very first time to the time that they leave, we made sure that we covered every single step. And then that was a part of the research training to ensure that everyone was comfortable, but that we didn't miss anything and we didn't skip anything. So this is a part of our protocol for the Maternal Mental Health Project. And then to your right, that's basically the eligibility component that talks about the um, wh who can participate, and then it talks about the procedures, what they're supposed to, what, what they are to expect, and then and you know everything that's in the consent form. So we took a two and a half page consent form that appeared to be very academic and 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 was actually frightening to some participants during the. Uh, um, pilot. Um, a lot of participants even stated, oh, this is just too much. I can't read it or my eyes hurt and things of that nature. And so we knew we needed to come up with something a little different. So this is why it is so important for the community to be involved in the process. Because as Dr. Hernandez stated earlier, if it's just from a clinician or a university or research level, we may miss some things. And the community can share what they need and how they can receive it. So these are a few of the documents that we created um, for this particular project. And so we're still in the process of data collection, but just wanted to go over some preliminary results. And as we saw with just the 39 surveys that we, and we have more, but they need to be analyzed, but this is from a couple of months ago, that we're on par with what national data is saying, and actually a little bit higher, that 63% of the participants self-reported they had a mental health concern. Um, and the questions were actually um, adapted from the Edinburgh scale. So we had a couple of different validated measures that were included on the survey. And so you had the Edinburgh scale, but we had the CAN go through that scale and say, okay, how can we make these questions or frame them in a way that's understandable to the community. And so, um, so a lot of it was actually changed to fit the needs of the community and making sure that they understood. And including what I mentioned earlier, how black women describe mental health concerns. So including information about physical symptoms. How would they describe anxiety? Oh, is your heart racing really quickly? Things of that nature. And so we're hoping to validate how we adapted it to fit the needs of our community. We also included the Adverse Childhood Experiences Scale, which we don't have reported here, um, but, um, but again, making sure that they're validated measures. Another thing that the CAN mentioned that was really important and that we know has a huge role in why Black women are not being identified in terms of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders is this idea of implicit bias. Um, and so we included a group-based medical mistrust scale that looks at um, from a, a one participant's perspective, how they feel providers may be treating them or how providers look at their types of communities. And then other things related to what the literature said are contributing factors or put particularly black women at risk of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. One of the biggest things that we wanted to find out was why aren't people 
talking to their providers. You know, oftentimes when it comes to mental health or any other type of condition, a lot of responsibility is put on on the on the woman, right? Or on on the on the patient, rather than finding out well what's the relationship between the provider and the patient. Um, and one of the reasons why women said that they're not, or first of all, a lot of them did say they weren't screened. Um, and then a second thing they said was that there's this lack of comfort talking to their health care provider about mental health. And the biggest thing being was that they were not asked about their mental health or they were not screened or they felt really embarrassed to say, you know what, I have, you know, something's going on with me. I just don't feel quite right. What can it be? Another concern of, of about it was, again, we talked about stigma and being labeled, right? And so they were concerned about it being noted in their medical records. And a reason for that was some of them expressed, you know, in an open-ended response that they, they didn't want their children be, to be taken away from them if they were noted that they had some type of mental health challenge or concern or that they want to be, again, labeled as some, some type of crazy woman. Because there's this perception of women of color and particularly black women being labeled as a strong black woman. So it's something, oh, I'll get over it. It's not a big deal. If it's noted, then I'll be scarred for life. You know, So I don't even want to talk about it or I don't want it to be noted there. Another thing we did, um, and so that's from the survey. Another thing we did was, um, and I labeled it mirror talk because that's what came out of the qualitative interviews. Um, when I said, well, you know, if we had to talk about mental health, if we had to label it a certain way, what would you label it? And someone said, well, maybe we need to talk to women about having these mirror talks. Maybe we need to look in the mirror and say, okay, you know, like, let's, let's talk about it to ourselves. What is it that we're going through? What are we currently experiencing? Um, you know, do a self check, figure it out, and then talk to a provider about it. Um, and so these interviews were conducted with family support workers or, you know, community outreach workers. And a, a lot of occurring themes that came about was that these women don't have support. A lot of them come from situations where they're by themselves or they had an unplanned pregnancy and now they're out. To, to figure it all out on themselves. And so either a partner leaves them or they don't already have family members that are around. And because of this pregnancy, maybe lost some family members or just, just don't have any support. Um, and a lot of them said they felt that, um, you know, it was the social determinants of health that were more pressing than their mental health. A lot of these women are experiencing um, a housing crisis. A lot of them are homeless. I think, you know, when I spoke to one of the family support workers, they mentioned about 60% of their clients don't have housing um, uh, or are homeless. And we don't mean homeless in the conventional way that people think that they're living in a shelter, which meant many are, but many aren't. Well, they're living with family members or they're so, de you know, they, and they have to be dependent on those situations, which cause and exacerbate the amount of stress that they're going through. When we talked about how to get people to, you know, what, what can black women do? Why aren't they receiving the support? Um, and, you know, these family support workers or these, you know, women that work with these with women who are experiencing these mental health conditions every day are saying, well, it needs to be addressed right away. If, you know, we see that there's a shortage of mental health providers, if it's not addressed right then and there, these women are not going to go back. So how can we bring them back? How can we, you know, and a lot of them also said that they want face-to-face -face time. So if someone gives them a number, they're going to not feel, you know, they're going to be embarrassed to call that number. It has to be a personal interaction. They need to see someone and talk to them face to face. And most of them also preferred someone that looked like them. And so, you know, that, you know, like, of course, they would accept any help, but that there's something about another Black woman talking to them about their mental health concerns that's really important. And that's where this whole cultural relevancy comes into place, too. And as we mentioned before, um, a lot of the FSWs think that the numbers are really higher because the screening tools are not really capturing Black women's experiences or how they talk about mental health. Or, you know, like they have to dig a little bit deeper because what they're going to do on some of the screening tools is tell you what you think you want to hear or what they think will get them by without someone having to talk to them about it afterwards, even though they really are experiencing a lot of mental health issues and trauma from their adverse childhood experiences. 
And then again, why they're not reporting that is because of the repercussions that are associated with mental health challenges or conditions. They don't want their children taken away if they qualify or are in a home and now they're deemed as having a mental health condition, will they lose their housing? So again, all of this is tied to those social determinants of health. So um, a big part of research too is, you know, and the distrust that comes with the community is that, you know, yes, we have research, but how are we using it? How how will it work for women? How can how can we develop policies or tools that work for Black mamas? And this was a convening um, through the Black Mamas Matters Alliance that happened, in which um, a lot of CAN partners are considered kindred partners. Um, and this is what we're doing. We're disseminating that information. We are doing it through webinars. We're going back to the communities and sharing that information. And we're ensuring that we're working with our state health departments to, to provide this information so that we can figure out solutions together. Because again, as we mentioned, this is not a project just about us. It's about all of us working together to achieve outcomes that are beneficial. Um, and so again, we're thinking of a white paper. We're working on statistical briefs and developing fact sheets like that maternal um, mental health um, fact sheet that Danette showed you earlier. Um, with next steps, what we're trying to do is continue the surveys. We have a goal of about 600 surveys and um, we're hopeful that we can get there because again with trust um, with our CAN partners and all of us working together, we can do that. We're continuing in-depth interviews. So we'll be interviewing not just the family support workers, but women who are currently pregnant and may be experiencing a mental health condition. And then also healthcare providers or people that provide mental health services. Um, and we're hoping with all of that, that we can create culturally relevant screening tools and develop interventions that can be implemented in community-based settings. Because we know, you know, there's still a big portion of women who don't have access to care. Um, as soon as they give birth, they lose a lot of that care that they were currently receiving. And so how do we implement it in spaces that Black women are comfortable and already receiving services? And so that that's, I think, the biggest essence of what we're trying to achieve with this project. So in summary, um, and this is a picture of Dunbar Elementary School in which the community um, is a part of, we must motivate a collective move when it comes to research and figuring out solutions. Everything we did as a CAN as, as a, in, in this research project was community-led and was culturally responsive because we want to ensure that we are equipping communities with the knowledge and tools so that they're the drivers of research in their own communities. And again, through, through this training, through everything that we're doing, we're hoping that we can provide vital information and the ability of the community to be able to use that information um, and thus becoming contributing mother, members rather than voiceless observers or dependents on what other people have to show them. Because the elimination of health disparities, particularly when it comes to men maternal mental health, will only occur when underserved communities are empowered with information and are partners in the research regarding their own health. And that's, that's the essence of what this CBPR Black Maternal Mental Health Project is about. So um, with that, um, Danette, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Um, well, just to basically to piggyback on what you said, the most important part of this is we knew in the community that our moms were having challenges. But we in the community did not know what to do because no research, there was no data and there was no research. And so, um, you know, we had to come together. And so um, this partnership with Morehouse School of Medicine, the Center for Black Women's Wellness, um, the Atlanta Health and Start Initiative Community Action Network, and all of its partners, including Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies of Georgia, Odyssey Family Counseling Services, Emory University, Mental Health America of Georgia, Prevent Child Abuse of Georgia, Well Care, the State of Georgia Department of Public Health, Partner Support, I mean, Postpartum Support International, The Well, Amerigroup, Shelter in Arms, Atlanta Public Schools, um, Families First, the Center for Family and Community Wellness, all of this coming together as Natalie said earlier, 
is so that this research can translate into effective services and policy change. We're not just doing it just to have a name written in a journal. We're doing it because families are hurting, and that's why we're doing this. So thank you. So I guess right now, Micah, we can start taking some questions. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, that was wonderful. We did have one question earlier. Um, if the slides would be available, um, are there any slides or information that we can make available um, to the uh, audience? Yeah, we can we can definitely do that. So um, we can get together as a group and then um, we'll send that out to you, Micah. Okay. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to either write them in the box or um, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you so that you can ask your question. I'm just checking now to see if there are any hands raised. Well, I don't see any now. Um, again, if you, like I said, if you want to put it in the box or, okay, here's one. Uh, Margaret Master says, wonderful work. Does the project include exploration of the physical toll of mental health, heart health, et cetera, and how that might vary for this community? Can you say one more time, Micah? Does it include... Sure. Um, so uh, does the project include exploration of the physical toll of mental health, um, like heart health, et cetera, and how uh, that might vary for this community? So the physical impact of, of mental health. Yeah. Um, currently, not right now. I mean, I mean, those are things that we know are important that we, and we need to explore um, because, again, we know, you know, people tend to treat the body separate from the mind and we know that it's interconnected. Um, but no, that's not something we're currently exploring right now, but definitely in the future. Great. And then Latoya Stevenson uh, said it was a wonderful presentation and I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There's another uh, question from Kate T. What do you feel is most needed to support mothers with depressive symptoms engaging and engaging with the resources to which they were referred? I think what's amazing about how um, the Atlanta Healthy Start um, and their family support workers do is, you know, Oftentimes, again, we just want to provide them to a mental health resource. But I think with the women, a lot of the supports they need are unrelated really to mental health. I think it's these social determinants, so housing, job, childcare. I think those are really important factors. And then making sure that we link them to care right away, but care that's affordable and care that can happen um, instant, instantaneously. Because again, as we mentioned, particularly with the population we work with, if, if there's an appointment and it's scheduled for next month, because they're already so hesitant to agree to get help in the first place, they'll make up a lot of excuses to not attend that appointment or you know, or just don't have the time to because of some of the, the jobs that they work and stuff. You know, a lot of appointments that are made are between nine and five, Monday through Friday. And we know with our community, oftentimes their jobs don't allow for them to seek those services or have the opportunities to seek those services. So I think those are key considerations on how we can help these women that are expressing depressive um, symptoms and stuff. And I think just being a support, I think if we have an opportunity right then and there, I know there are a lot of mental health trainings. I think, you know, we rely a lot and, and I think it's great. We need to focus on psychiatrists and all these other mental health providers, but if there's some way that we can help them right then and there, I think that's really crucial. Danette, did you have anything to add related to that? 
No, I think you touched base on it. I, but I, I would like to add one more thing. It's so important that our families are educated on signs of possible mental health challenges um, and not just brush it off as someone having a bad day. It's so important that um, we, in, in fact, the event that we had on Saturday, we talked about uh, Mental Health America of Georgia discussed um, ways to identify when someone may need a little more assistance and it's not just a bad day. So I think that that's something. And I'd like to also invite anyone that is listening to our Community Action Network. You know, come and get involved with us. We meet the third Tuesday of every month. Um, we are relocated to our new location. It's going to be at Southside Medical Center on Ridge Road, um, right off of Pryor and University, Southside Medical Center. And we meet from 12 until 2 on the third Tuesday of the month. It is open to the community. It's not just for um, clinicians or organizations or agencies or public health departments. It's open to the community. And if you're really interested in helping us make a difference, please come and join us. We have several work groups that will be meeting tomorrow. In fact, our next can is tomorrow, the 21st of May. So I want to make sure that's out there. And if anyone is interested, uh, Micah, if um, we can, you know, if you can forward our email addresses to them and we can follow up with them offline. Great. We'll do. Uh, so we've got about five more minutes left. Um, um, Kate says, thank you. Let me just check and see if there are any other questions or hands raised. I would like to also add um, in the acknowledgments, I did thank Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies of Georgia for their um, participation with this project, but I want to go one step further and say, as our legislative partner, Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies of Georgia has assisted us in looking not only at the research side, but how that research can translate into policy. And that's always important to look down the road at what change can occur. And so Michael shared initially this morning about the first maternal mental health day uh, in the state of Georgia was May the 1st this year, and we're so happy about that. Funding has been allocated to start in different areas uh, for uh, state maternal mental wellness, looking at Department of Public Health and Department of Deve Developmental Disabilities and Behavioral Health, but just looking at how we can work together. So I just wanted to also acknowledge you, Micah and Elise, um, and of course, Jamie Dorsey, the CEO for the Center for Black Women's Wellness, we thank you for your leadership in this project as a co-PI. I'd like to also thank uh, Janina Dor uh, Daniels, who is the current uh, manager, program manager for the Atlanta Healthy Start Initiative and her dynamic team. Um, and then also Natasha Worthy, who was uh, instrumental in the beginning of this research as the uh, former project manager uh, for the Atlanta Healthy Start Initiative. The State of Georgia Department of Public Health, we want to definitely thank them for their assistance with the evaluation, Linda Tran and Paige Jones uh, and Janine uh, Galloway. We want to thank all of you for all that you've done to assist us in moving this forward. Certainly. Thank you, Danette. Um, and yeah, we just appreciate you all. Um, and thank you for joining this webinar. Um, as our presenters mentioned, we will get um, a PDF uh, document out to you on with the slides, as well as you'll receive a link to participate in the survey. Um, the survey is um, encouraged, and uh, but also mandatory for those that are interested in receiving the nursing CE for uh, this one hour presentation. So um, you'll receive that from me within the day or so. Um, and then, like I said, uh, certificates will be available within the week. So thank you again. Um, thank you to our presenters and the wonderful work that they're doing. And um, if I can be of any assistance, please feel free to email me with any additional questions, and I'll be sure to get that to our presenters. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Micah. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.